Tim Brooks, Heart of Virginia Aviation, Director of Operations. Want to talk to you briefly about Rotax engines and my experiences with them. Uh, I began very biased to the engine and have changed my mind completely. Uh, after I was trained on Rotax engines, I spent uh, some time researching why the Rotax engine had such a bad rap. What came to light was the maintenance was improperly done, not the engine. There was nothing wrong with the engine. People just hadn't learned how to maintain these engines, period. Let me tell you a few things that I did learn. The first thing you have to worry about is checking the oil on the Rotax engine. Uh, the Rotax engine utilizes crankcase pressure to push the oil out of what's considered a dry sump into the, uh, the reservoir tank. To do that, we have to turn the propeller and we listen for air to come from the engine out into the tank, and it's called burping the tank. There it goes. So we burp it and then check the level, and as you can see, about three-fourths of the way up the flat on the stick, so we've got plenty of oil. One of the things I love about this engine is that we have an aluminum head, an aluminum barrel, and an aluminum case. Therefore, our expansion rates, heat and contraction, are all the same. Shock cooling's always been a problem on Continentals and Lycomings. Not that I'm saying that you want to go out and try to shock cool this engine, but this can handle temperature changes much easier than a Continental or Lycoming. On the flip side, overheating this engine can severely damage it by annealing or softening the cylinder heads from overheat. Therefore, you always want to make sure that that coolant level is maintained and we have no leaks. Now, the coolant can be checked in two locations. Number one, in the coolant tank itself. This is the overflow tank. This should see a little bit of coolant in there at all the time. Just because this has coolant in it doesn't mean that the reservoir is going to be completely full. So we do want to check the reservoir. We do this with the engine cold, pop the cap, take a look, make sure it's full, and we have plenty of coolant. Again, this is under pressure when it gets hot, so you got to make sure that cap is replaced properly. Vital to check for coolant leaks. Where we're going to check is obvious coolant areas that uh, may produce leaks, and that's going to be around elbows, rubber hoses, underneath the return lines, and around the radiator itself on the inlet and exit ports here and here. Normally uh, we don't have the luxury of having the cowling off the aircraft so during a pre-flight check the bottom cowling to make sure you don't have any oil or uh, coolant leaks dripping down into that bottom cowling. Another important item you want to check is the exhaust springs on the muffler to exhaust pipe transition areas. There are two at each location, so you're going to have eight, eight uh, springs to check during the pre-flight. If you find that you're missing a spring or you're starting to lose springs on a regular basis, good idea to get your carburetors balanced. It shows an imbalance and, an, and creates a vibration, otherwise it won't be an issue. Carburetor balance is an important issue with this engine. Uh, oftentimes vibrations with this engine and that you experience in the cockpit are ignored. Uh, the reason it's important is this uh, engine operates uh, basically is two engines in one. The left bank of cylinders and right bank of cylinders have their own independent carburetor and independent ignition system. So when a vibration starts to occurring, the, the first thing that we want to check is that carburetor balance. A bad habit I've seen that uh, has been brought over from the Continental and Lycomings is trying to start this engine by cracking the throttle. Uh, this engine is going to be very difficult to start that way. In this carburetor, we really have two carburetors in one. We have the primary and we have the choke or starting carb. The starting carb just allows more fuel during startup to allow ease of starting. That's why you call it a choke. This, car, this engine needs to have the throttle pulled completely back to idle, the starting carb or choke engaged, starting, then bring the throttle up to approximately 2100 RPM while at the same time reducing the choke to zero. One of the things that came to light in my research in finding why this engine got a bad rap is a lot of the problems were caused by turning this prop backwards. Remember, we're operating a dry sump system. So if we're using crankcase pressure to push the oil out of the, the sump, just the opposite is going to happen if we turn this prop backwards. We now draw air into the valve train and we can get air inside the hydraulic lifters, which will cause severe damage to the cylinders, breaking valves and so forth. 
Burning the 100 octane in this engine is acceptable, but it does create problems. This engine does not require the lubrication from the lead that is in 100 octane. So we've got to do a few things if we are burning 100 octane to help keep that lead build up to a minimum. Number one is keep your RPMs up during operation above 5200 RPM. You want to do 25 hour oil changes uh, and you want to take the sump completely off during oil changes and clean it out. The lead will build up inside that tank. Uh, there's also some changes to the maintenance that you have to do during the inspection and that would be to uh, inspect the slip clutch in the gear reduction drive to make sure that lead hasn't built up in there causing that to prematurely slip. Remember a lot of the items that we've touched on today are not commonplace. These are just things I'd like you to be aware of during your pre-flight. I'm Tim Brooks and thanks for watching.